Hey, what's up? I'm Andrew with Field Treasure Design. So behind me is my Ron Polk workbench, and this is part two of my three-part video series on showing you how I made my Ron Polk workbench. And so part two is the main body and structure of the workbench, and I'd love to show you how I did it, so check this out. So here I've got the cuts that I made in part one of my video series, the main tops and bottoms and the spacers. Next, I laid them out to decide which boards I wanted on the outside versus the ones that would be cut to be on the inside to use as spacers. After I picked the four outside ones, I had to then measure for the inside ones. It's important to measure the width of your plywood just to make sure you get the measurements of your spacers correct. Here I'm measuring just under 23 inches to account for the fact that the width of my plywood is a little bit more than half inch. So then it's just a matter of using the miter saw to cut all the middle sections to length. Here I'm using the extra cutoffs from the sawhorses to use as additional spacers. I cut them to length and then take them over to the table saw to get them ripped down to the same width. Since a couple of the boards were different widths by just a hair, it was good to make sure they were all even with just a few passes. Here I'm ripping down those extra pieces that I took from the sawhorses. Now it's time to cut one of the spacers out for the template to router the rest of them. I mark a center line across the board for reference and right here is the center point for my four and a half inch hole saw. Time to go to work drilling the holes. I'm still using the sheet of insulation to act as a pad so I can drill through the wood if needed. Once I got the pilot hole through, I was able to turn the piece over, clamp it down, and then line up the center drill bit into the hole from the other side. It makes for a very clean cut. So now just do the other side, and then when finished, it's time to do the straight cuts. I actually like to freehand them with my circular saw. Now, if you'll notice, I stop short with the circular saw so that I can clean it up later with the jigsaw to get close to those radiuses. The jigsaw allows me to get a little bit closer on those curves, and I went around to clean up where the hole saw left a few jagged edges. And boom, now I've got the template ready. Okay, so my whole setup for this template cutting is pretty difficult, but that's why I'm building the workbench anyways. The difficult part here is that my clamps aren't low profile enough, so I have to be really careful to stop, readjust them, and keep going. But slow and steady wins the race here. I'm using the same quarter inch router bit that I used on my sawhorse legs with the same collar. So after my first pass, I unclamped it and took a look, turned it around to then clamp it again to do the other side. I used different clamps this time just to see if they would work a little better. Now I'm doing the final pass. As you can see, I had to stop and readjust just to make sure my template was lined up. Okay, it worked pretty good, but I still wasn't convinced that this was the best method for cutting out all of my spacers. Clamping the piece down from the side allowed me to have more control over the workpiece. Unfortunately, I still had to stop and readjust my clamp to allow my router to pass by that area. Then I had to do it again, moving that clamp to allow the router to pass by. But the good news here was that my workpiece, as you can see, never moved at all. Okay, I got my second spacer done, and I think this method is a little bit better. A quick vacuuming to clear the work area, and then we're gonna start again. And there's my method, slowly but surely stopping at every corner to move the clamps and get the radiuses cut, and little by little, I got all the spacers cut. Awesome, just seven more to go and we'll be finished with this part. Phew, done. Now I'm gonna take the same methodology and apply it to the long ones that will be on each side of the workbench. There's going to be four holes cut out of these long ones and so I started by laying them out to make sure they were spaced evenly. 
Then I just repeated the same process that I had done with the small spacers, just this time going one at a time on the long ones. So now it's just a matter of working your way up the board. And now after a little vacuuming, there's one complete side. Only have three left to do. After I cut all the holes out of all the spacers, I grabbed my Colt router with a little roundover bit and went around all the edges. This is to smooth out those edges just so you never get splinters. Next, I grabbed my Craig K5 pocket hole jig to drill pocket holes into all of the spacers. The four eight foot long sections only need them on the bottom. You also want to space them out so that they don't get in the way of the small spacers. Next, you just repeat the process until all four are finished. Next, you have to do pocket holes for the side spacers as well. The only difference with these is you do them on the bottom and on the sides. For each spacer, I'm doing three pocket holes on the side, three pocket holes on the bottom, and three pocket holes on the other side. So you can kind of get in a groove on this spacing. Okay, I'm sure you get the idea. Now that all the pocket holes are drilled, I turned my attention to the top section of the workbench. There are 220 holes drilled into the top of the workbench. A good way to save time is to layer them on top of each other and do both sections together. Here I am laying out 110 holes to be doubled up when I drill through both of them. Okay, ready to start drilling. This was also a new process for me and I wasn't quite set up for it, so I had to do some trial and error by using straight edges clamped to the work surface. I'm using a three quarter inch spiral upcut routing bit that's high quality for this application. While it's not cheap, you definitely want to invest in this bit because you're drilling so many holes and you're going through over an inch of material. You can't see it, but on my router, I actually marked with a Sharpie the middle section of that flat straight edge. That way I could line up the bit on every line right on the middle. My straight edge wasn't long enough to cover the eight foot length of my work surface, so I grabbed a premium pine board to cover the distance. With one line down, it was time to move to the bottom line. I just lined everything up and repeated the process. Three lines done, only two lines left. It's important to move the board around so you just have a better angle when you're drilling your last two lines. I'm coming into the home stretch for the last line and you can see the smoke starting to come off of that bit. I can't emphasize it enough to do not cheap out when you buy the bit. Look at how satisfying that is to pull off both sheets and have doubled up. 220 holes. Okay, a quick pause to show you my cleanup because so much sawdust is generated by this part of the project. I also wanted to remind you of the workbench situation that I was working with. It's not the greatest, but it shows you what you can accomplish with what you have, and it shows you why I'm so motivated to build the Polk workbench. Okay, back to the project. Now before I can assemble everything, there's one last detail to do while the pieces are laying flat. While my two inside pieces are laying flat together, it was easy to do a one inch hole to allow a space once the table is assembled, just in case I want room for the router table sled that the Polk workbench plans call for. I'm not doing them in this build, but I wanted to make this just in case. Here you can see it just a little bit better, and I'm using a one inch Forzner bit to allow that hole to be drilled so that each piece has a radius cut out once it's assembled. And here's the second one. Mm -hmm. 
Now it's finally time to start assembling the workbench table. So here I'm deciding which spacers are going to be on the outside edges and then which will be on the inside edges. After I laid everything out, I started with standing up the side spacer against one of the ends. I take a bead of wood glue and run it against the bottom. Then I grab my silicone spreader just to spread out the glue. Remember, the glue is what is really going to hold this box together. The fasteners simply hold it while it dries. Now it's just a matter of screwing in the pocket hole screws to hold the wood in place. I started on one end and then secured the other end. Then it's just a matter of filling in the middle parts. After I got to the end, I grabbed a clamp just to hold that corner secure while I got the end piece and glued it up. You gotta spread out that glue for maximum bonding. So now it's just a matter of attaching all the pocket hole screws. Now I head over to the other side and do the exact same thing. Now it's time to rotate the assembly so I can get to the outside edge a little easier. Now I just repeat the process, glue up the side and spread it out and then get ready to flip it over and attach it. Same thing here, do one side and then the other side, then you can anchor down the middle section. Before fastening the side, it's a good idea to add your spacers in just to make sure everything fits okay. You can always make adjustments if your spacers are still a little bit too long. After that, just fasten it down. Next, it's time to glue and fasten the three middle spacers. The biggest thing here is just to make sure each one is square and perpendicular to the sides. I'm using my large speed square and an adjustable square to keep everything in line. Once I get one side done, I then move to the other side to keep everything square. Then just pop in the bottoms. Now I'll show you the other two from different angles just so you have a good idea on how I do it. Okay, for the second side, I'm gonna let it roll pretty quickly here because you probably get an idea, but you may wanna see the other side assembled as well. So here it is. Here you can see the sideboard bowing inward a little bit. So that's why it's important to put the spacer in to make sure that when you screw it in, it's nice and square.
Okay, sweet, we're done assembling the boxes. Before I put the bottoms on, there's a few more things I need to take care of before I seal it up. The Polk workbench plans call for a really cool feature that allows you to lock both of the assembly tables together. Here, I'm drilling a 3 8 inch hole through both of the sides. Then I'm gonna take that bolt with the washer, stick it through, and use that lock nut to be able to tighten up both sides together. But the Polk design takes it one step further by allowing a design that keeps the washer, the bolt, and the lock nut all together. Here, I'm drilling a two inch hole with my Forstner bit to make a clean cut, and then backing it up with my hole saw to pass it all the way through. That diameter is going to pass just halfway on that 3 8 inch hole, as you can see, creating a notch. Then it's just a matter of doing it on the other side. I decided to keep mine on the same part of the assembly table so only one side would carry the bolts. Okay, good to go. Now I'm gonna show you real quick how this works. You just simply thread the bolt through with the washer and the bolt head on the outside where my hand is, and then the butterfly lock nut is on the inside. Then you just slide the washer through that big hole and then drop it down into the notch. Obviously the whole design is gonna be flipped over since this is the bottom, but you get the idea here. A quick adjustment on the other side to line up the pieces and it falls into place. Then come back for a quick tightening and the workbench is secure on both sides. Now that that part's done, it was time to turn my attention to the pipe guides and stops. There are a few scraps from the project that you can use to make this really easily. I started by ripping down all of the pieces to four inches in width. Once I had eight of them cut, I took them to my miter saw to cut them to seven inches in length. I clamped a stop block to my miter saw to make the process go a little bit quicker. Next, I needed to drill holes into six of my pipe guides. The other two are gonna be pipe stops and don't need holes. The pipes are one inch in diameter, so it's important to make your hole just a little bit bigger, like 1 16th extra, so that those pipes can slide freely through the holes. Here, I'm using another Forzner bit, which allows me to make a nice clean hole. In order to make sure that my pipe guides had the exact same hole on them so that those pipes would slide smoothly, I used the first one that I cut out as a template to get my hole started on the next ones. I'm also using a piece of scrap wood underneath just to be careful. After I got all six of my pipe guide holes cut, I went ahead and laid them out. Now it's very important when you lay out your pipe guides that you're doing so with the end in mind in terms of building your table saw platform. I'm using the DeWalt DW745 for my table saw, so it's important that the width of my placement for the pipes is gonna work for that saw. And if you're interested, don't forget to check out my video on how I cut my pipes and made my custom platform for my table saw. When it was time to fasten the pipe guides, I used a drill bit as a pilot hole just so I wouldn't split any of the wood. Then I just fastened one at a time until they were all ready. The two pipe guides that are closest to the table saw are going to be on the inside of the workbench, so don't forget that. Once all of them were fastened, it was time to do a test fit. So the left one went in great, but the right side hit a bit of a snag. I guess it's a good thing because I can show you what I did. So I measured each area and realized it was my second spacer. All I had to do was reattach it in the right spot. Then it was all good. Next, I pulled the pipes out so that I could flip over the box tops and I wanted a router around the edges because I had just a little bit of overhang. Then I laid out my bottoms and got them in their right places. Before I'm gonna secure them though, there's one more thing to do. The Polk workbench plans call for four 11 inch long and three quarter inch wide cutouts so that these boxes can rest on the saw horses. It's a really cool feature and it was definitely worth doing. So I measured out exactly where they needed to go. Then I grabbed my three quarter inch Forzner router bit to drill a hole on each end of the notch. This makes it a lot easier to guide that router bit from one end to the next without going too long. A couple more holes and I'm ready to grab the router. This process was pretty simple. I lined up the router with the bit and then grabbed a straight edge to make sure that the router from end to end was gonna line up. I then moved carefully along the line. I stopped about three quarters of the way down to be able to reinsert it on the next hole and then come back and meet it in the middle just to make sure that line was straight. Boom, now just three more to go. 
This is another reminder not to cheap out on this router bit. It's the same one I used for the bench dog holes, so it's worth it to pay for the good one. And now, of course, it's time to sand. I'm using 220 grit sandpaper again just to get all those edges nice and smooth. After I'm done sanding, I lay out the bottoms, and remember, I'm not going to glue them in case I need to make changes later. I grabbed a piece of half inch scrap to go around and make a line so I knew exactly where to drill in the screws. The one inch wood screws need to go in between the edge and the line. That way they go directly into the half inch plywood underneath. I also drilled pilot holes with a countersink drill bit just to make sure that those screws went in without splitting any of the wood. Then I just screwed each one in real carefully. It's also important to secure the bottom to the inside spacers, and so using a straight edge and a tape measure, you just have to go a little slower just to make sure you get each one in. Then I did one last pass with my router using that straight edge with the ball bearing guide to get a little overhang that was left over to smooth off those edges. Oh yes, it's now time to assemble my Polk workbench for the very first time. And of course, just like Ron Polk did in his YouTube videos, I had to get on top to test out the strength. And it passed. After I was done, I grabbed my 220 grit sandpaper and you know how it is, had to sand it down nice and smooth. And there it is, my Ron Polk workbench. Man, I cannot believe I actually got it done. What an amazing project. Hey, don't forget to go to Ron Polk's website to download and get his plan so you can build your own. I hope this video was helpful and don't forget to subscribe to stay connected on all my future videos. Thanks.